I think we're going to get started. It's a great pleasure to see you all. Um, I'm Lenny Bernardo with the Open Society Foundations. And to my right is Adam Schatz, writer, journalist, essayist, and the author of the book that we're going to discuss today, The Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Frantz Fanon. But before we begin, I have two comments uh, related to Desi Gavrilova that I would like to raise. Two reservations, if I might. The first is, this is the second year in a row when I have been asked to close the Vienna Humanities Festival. <laughs> and I, I don't know if there'll ever be a time when Desi will schedule me to perhaps somewhere in the middle to open it. Maybe I'm just her favorite closer, <laughs> but I wonder if this says something about my capacities. <laughs> this, the, second, the second issue is, is Desi, she's in the front row by the way, Desi asked me um, some weeks ago to steward this event with Adam, and I was quite reticent because Adam is a very dear and old friend of mine. We met 34 years ago this month on the campus of the now notorious <laughs> Columbia University. <laughs> and I felt that I did not necessarily have the critical detachment necessary to interview someone as dear to me as Adam. But then I said, fuck it. <laughs> Why should we fetishize objectivity? <laughs> We've been having these conversations for 34 years. This is just another, one. another one. So here we are. I think it would be useful, Adam, for us to begin with at least a thumbnail sketch of Fanon's biography. Um, he lived only to the tender age of 36 when he passed in 1961 of leukemia. But I thought in the, in the context of that sketch, if you could make reference to the title of your book, what both the Rebels Clinic means and in the subhead, why the plural, revolutionary lives? Sure. Um, thank you, Lenny. It's wild to be sitting with you here, um, uh, but great. And, and thank you, Desi, uh, and everyone involved with the uh, Humanities Festival for inviting me and for giving this kind of space to this book. I'm, I'm very, very appreciative, so thank you. Um, so the, the title, The Rebels Clinic, um, alludes to the fact that, first of all, Fanon was a psychiatrist. Uh, he studied in France, um, in Lyon, to be precise, uh, after the Second World War, was exposed to a lot of radical currents in French psychiatry, uh, did his residency uh, at the Saint Alban Clinic, where he became the protege of a Catalan psychiatrist by the name of Francois Tosquelles, who was practicing an innovative form of therapy called institutional therapy. Tosquelles had actually been the chief psychiatrist of the Spanish Republic. He was part of the PUM, the Trotskyist anarchist militia, and uh, was expelled to France. So Fanon uh, was a psychiatrist, uh, and my argument in this book is that Fanon's particular approach to psychiatry permeated um, everything that he did as a, um, as a writer and also as a political activist. Uh, Fanon uh, famously uh, was a West Indian born in Fort de France, Martinique in 1925 who joined the fight against fascism in France, joined the Free French Forces. Uh, a French citizen. A French citizen, well. absolutely. And um, who published uh, after the war at the age of 27, 
an extraordinary analysis of the psychological impact of racism, black skin, white masks. And then a year later, 1953, ended up going to Algeria to become the chef de service in a psychiatric hospital just outside of Algiers, the psychiatric hospital of Blida-Joinville. And 11 months later, the Algerian War of Independence uh, broke out against French rule, and Fanon uh, began to treat rebels, even as he was also treating uh, French soldiers, perpetrators of torture, and so on. And Fanon ultimately joined the uh, Front de Libération Nationale, the Algerian Liberation, Na National Liberation Front, was expelled, ended up in Tunis, became a spokesman for the movement, eventually a traveling ambassador for the FLN in French West Africa, um, well, in, 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 in West Africa, rather. He was, he was based in Accra. Um, and Fanon uh, died, as Lenny noted, at 36 of uh, leukemia in Bethesda, Maryland. Now, uh, uh, Fanon, uh, in my book, uh, I, I portray him as someone who was a, uh, was a rebel, was a critic of orthodoxies, was a critic of um, the false promises of French universalism, um, was a critic, of course, of colonial rule in Algeria, um, who was drawn to all the dissident currents of thought of his time, existentialism, phenomenology, anti-colonialism, the movement of black consciousness known as Negritude, which had been founded by his uh, uh, mentor, uh, Aimé Césaire. But Fanon was also someone who had uh, an attraction to power, and that's part of the ambivalence that I try to evoke in Fanon. He was a critic of systems, but he also wanted to exercise some worldly power, and he uh, eventually rose to a position, uh, he became a kind of apparatchnik uh, within, the, uh, within the FLN and had to make the kinds of compromises that come with taking part in worldly politics. And so part of what I'm trying to do in this book is to analyze the tensions between the rebel and, and the revolutionary bureaucrat that Fanon became. Why lives? Why plural? Because in the short period in which he lived, 36 years, uh, Fanon took part in multiple revolutions, both political um, and intellectual. Revolutionary psychiatry, which I mentioned, various forms of radical philosophy, anti-colonialism, black consciousness. He was involved, of course, most famously in the Algerian struggle for independence but he also took part in movements of, Af of African independence against colonialism. He became quite close to Félix Moumier of Cameroon, Patrice Lumumba, Sekou Touré of Guinea. So Fanon's lives were plural, they were many. Um, uh, Zadie Smith remarked that he, uh, he, he, I, that he uh, lived more lives than most people do in a full life. Um, so I wanted to evoke uh, that plurality. And I also wanted to, uh, to emphasize that Fanon's text is an open one. I think we tend to think of his writing, much of it in the form of, uh, of insurrectionary manifestos, as one thing, as something that's quite simple, a sort of a, a series of radical catechisms. But actually, Fanon was too intelligent and too creative and too subtle, ultimately, to be contained by the form that he adopted um, in his writing. And this is one reason why uh, his work has um, traveled so far and wide and well beyond the movements that he himself belonged to. So, so let's stay on this point, Adam, of multiple identities. You know, there's a great line by the American Southern writer, Eudora Welty, where she says, everything is a sign when you're looking for one. And today it seems, and in recent decades, that especially those on the left look to Fanon in ways that will rehearse, reproduce, buttress, underscore their own way of seeing the world. There have been a lot of misreadings of Fanon, and one reason I think of many why your book is so special is that you don't have any axes to grind. Can you say a little bit about what you feel have been maybe some of these misreadings, especially on the left, vis-a-vis -vis Fanon? Sure. Um, the first, of course, is that Fanon was an identitarian. 
and that Fanon was um, a thinker of black consciousness, per se. I mean, he was certainly an anti-racist. He was uh, an advocate of black liberation, of also, of course, of Algerian liberation against colonialism. Uh, but Fanon really didn't believe that race existed. Fanon was an early critic of what Barbara Jean Fields, the American historian, has called racecraft. He understood race to be a set of fictions, but a set of fictions that were so powerful as to have um, very profound real world effects. Part of the reason for the misunderstanding of uh, Fanon's writing on race, um, part of it comes from the fact that he was poorly translated into English. Um, I can't say anything about the German translations, but if they were anything like the, the American translations, they were quite misleading. Uh, most famously, the chapter, The Lived Experience of the Black Man, which is probably the pivotal chapter in Black Skin, White Mass, L'Experience Vécue du Noir. It's a, it's a wrenching um, essay, um, and it's in some ways a clandestine autobiography. It's probably the closest that Fanon came to writing a piece of memoir and it revolves around this, um, this searing story about an encounter with a, a, a young, a little white boy in a train. Um, that chapter, The Lived Experience of the Black Man, was translated into English in the mid-1960s as the fact of blackness. And in fact, um, the ICA, the Great Cultural Institution in London, had a, a whole series of events and published uh, a book with the title The Fact of Blackness, and it was a tribute to Fanon. It was a huge misunderstanding of what Fanon actually had to say about race. For example, in Black Skin, White Mass, Fanon writes, the black man does not exist any more than the white man. So um, uh, Fanon's thinking about race actually is very critical of racialism. So that's one misunderstanding. Um, I think uh, another misunderstanding has to do you know, with Fanon's account of violence. Fanon was certainly an advocate of, uh, of armed struggle um, in the case of Algeria and, and certainly in other uh, cases of, of anti-colonial struggle. He understood violence to be a counter-violence um, against the violence of colonialism. Colonialism, of course, was a system that had been founded and maintained uh, by violence. Uh, but if you actually read uh, Fanon on violence, you find that there are all sorts of interesting reservations, caveats, and observations which introduce tension and nuance into his understanding of the uses of violence, which sorts of violence are legitimate, and what effects violence has on the future um, of, um, uh, for colonized peoples once they achieve liberation. And that also comes through in the last chapter of The Wretched of the Earth, uh, Colonial War and Mental Disorders, where he introduces us to a series of absolutely lacerating cases involving violence committed not just by the colonizer, but also violence committed by anti-colonial rebels. He writes about rebels who have undertaken violent missions during wars of independence and who are haunted by the actions that they undertook. So Fanon was a, a much more complex thinker than he has been given credit for. Speaking, speaking of violence, what, was, was Hannah Arendt aware of Fanon's writings when she wrote her own text on violence? Uh, she was very aware of Fanon's writings and she in fact cites Fanon. Um, she has been, um, uh, she's been attacked and in some cases vilified for supposedly attacking Fanon, but I actually think her approach to Fanon is, is more ambiguous. She's, she's far more critical in fact of Jean-Paul Sartre for the preface that Sartre wrote to the Wretched of the Earth, which is a far more um, incendiary account of violence than anything in Fanon's text. Which, which came out nine years after Black Skin, White Mask. The book, yes, the book came out in 1961. Uh, it came out in December 1961, just as Fanon lay dying in Bethesda, Maryland, and was confiscated uh, while he was on his deathbed. Uh, so, Arendt, you know, Arendt pointed at, Arendt made a very good point, though, about Fanon, about Fanon's account of violence, which is that, which is that the, Fanon hoped that violence could be a force of cohesion for, um, for insurgents and rebels, that by fighting and dying and sacrificing together, um, uh, 
lasting bonds could be forged and could give unity and cohesion to a popular movement fighting against colonialism. And, and Arendt's remark was that nothing is more ephemeral than the kind of bonds that, um, that develop in wartime. Come peacetime, uh, the divisions will, will multiply and intensify. But at the same time, she actually wrote quite respectfully of Fanon in her book on violence and said that he was much more textured in analysis of violence than Sartre had been. So I think it's, um, it's, it's an interesting example. Just in, in terms of that preface by Jean-Paul Sartre that you, that, that you mentioned, that preface at some point, you point out in the book, was removed. It was, um, it was. With Jean-Paul Sartre's support of Israel in the 67 war. Can you just maybe speak to that for sure. a moment? Sure. Um, in 1967, uh, Fanon's widow, uh, Josie Fanon, she's a French woman whom he had met in Lyon, and Fanon by then had been dead for six years. Uh, Josie Fanon uh, asked that uh, Sartre's preface uh, be removed um, because Sartre had supported Israel in the Six Day War and she, didn't, she no longer thought it was fitting that, 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 that a text by Sartre appear um, uh, as a preface to her, husband's, her late husband's work. Uh, it was restored later on by Fanon's editor, Francois Maspero, and uh, Sartre's own position with respect to Palestine and the Arab-Israeli conflict was a very, was a very troubled one. Um, he, you know, he would oscillate between expressions of um, support uh, for Israel and occasional defenses of uh, Palestinian uh, uh, resistance and even terrorism. For example, uh, uh, Saar uh, defended the attacks in Munich of 1972 and then reverted to his previous position of being very supportive um, of Israel. Uh, Saar was um, felt incredibly divided um, because he had very close friends in the Algerian liberation struggle, but he also um, had very close Jewish friends and I think also was, was um, bedeviled by the kind of guilt that so many uh, French people on the left had after the war over the occupation and the crimes of the Vichy government. You know, I, I, I want to bring things up, if we could, for a moment to the present day. Uh, when we look at, of course, the war um, in Gaza, the war in Lebanon. But first, a question, Adam. Obviously, Fanon is hailed justifiably as an anti-colonial thinker and writer, but not so much post-colonial. He died a year before the FLN um, uh, triumphed over the, over the French. But at the same time, we live in an age of decolonization of everything. Decolonize the academy, decolonize the IWM, <laughs> decolonize refrigeration, you know. <laughs> and I wonder what you think of this sort of uh, fetishization of the decolonial mm. with respect to how Fanon himself mm. might have adjusted to that framing. It's, it's, um, it, it's, a, it's a good question, and um, I think it's, it's, it's as hard to say what Fanon would have said about the, uh, the decolonial uh, movement and moment. Uh, it's, it's, hard to say, it's as hard to say what he would have made, it, made of it as it is to say what Fanon, for example, might have said about um, the events of October 7. Um, I, I, I hesitate. Um, to, to, to say anything for certain, but I mean, we can speculate, of course. Um, you know, Fanon, um, it's often forgotten that uh, Fanon uh, knew that he was on the winning side when he wrote The Wretch of the Earth. There was no doubt that these colonial empires uh, were collapsing. You know, Algeria was, was, re was relatively late. I mean, of course, there were other struggles against the Portuguese in Southern Africa, and Fanon took a great interest in those. But Algeria was late. You know, it, it was this, you know, brutal war of almost eight years. And, uh, but by the time Fanon uh, was writing The Wretch of the Earth in 1960-61, uh, he knew that, that, that the French were going to have to leave. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think his understanding was that 
the decolonization part was the easy part, in a sense. These empires were going to fall. What was important was social revolution. Um, in other words, these post-colonial states would never really amount to very much and would never provide real freedom and opportunity for their, for their citizens unless they, unless they had a social component. And he was uh, very worried that the so-called national bourgeoisie, this avaricious caste with uh, links to foreign powers, uh, would dominate the post-colonial states and deprive the masses, the term he might have used, um, from really enjoying the fruits of liberation. In that sense, he was concerned with this very Arendtian problem of the transition from liberation to freedom. Freedom is much more elusive. Now, today's understanding of decolonization is often very much about culture, and it's about restoration and reclamation. Um, which wasn't his project. Which wasn't. He was actually very critical of reclamation efforts. I mean, in fact, he was scathingly critical and mocking. He, he didn't believe in any politics and any cultural politics of return to a lost origin. Um, and I'd say this not to defend his position because I think in some ways he, he understated the role of culture um, and, and really kind of only tended to credit it in the Algerian case because, you know, as I suggest in this book, he was enchanted by what he saw in Algeria. But when it came, for example, to West Indian culture, to African culture, he tended to emphasize a politics of invention and creation rather than a politics of return. So in that regard, my sense is that Fanon would have been rather skeptical of, of the restorationist aspect of today's decolonization discourse. And I think that when it, when it, when it comes to you know, some of the more amusing iterations of decolonization, like um, restaurant menus, let's say, I think that Fanon would have regarded that as, as, a, as a kind of bourgeois waste of time. You know, he was really interested in questions of power, who owns things, you know, how are, the, how are the spoils of revolution going to be divided? How are we going to create systems of politics and authority that really give people a sense of participation in the decisions that dominate their lives? Those were the things that he attended to. Mm -hmm. I th but in, in, in terms of this indifference or perhaps ambivalence to culture, what would he have made of the film that was made five years after he died the Great Battle of Algiers, the Ponte Corvo film. What, what do you think he would have thought about that depiction of the Algerian Revolution? Well, I think, I think actually he, my, my sense is that he probably would have admired it um, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, for one thing, uh, so much of what we see in the Battle of Algiers is directly lifted from Fanon's own work. Ponte Corvo, uh, as many of you probably know, was, was, uh, was Italian. He was uh, from a left-wing family. One of his brothers ended up defecting to the Soviet Union. He was a, a nuclear physicist. Another ended up in London, I think. And, and Pontegorvo um, had been a communist, but then after 1956, he left the party and became attracted to the, the, the revolutions of what was then known as the, uh, the Third World, and I guess we now call the Global South and he became a very passionate reader of, uh, of Fanon. Uh, Fanon was very big in Italy um, in the early mid-1960s. Mid and so in, in Algiers, uh, he partnered up with one of the leaders of the FLN in the Kasba, Yasef Saadi. And Yasef Saadi uh, created Kasba films uh, with a guy named Serge Michel, who's a character in my book. Serge Michel was a French anarchist who was, who was um, a member of the FLN, worked with Fanon in, in Tunis. And Serge Michel and, and uh, Yasef Sadi forged this film company, Cosmo Films, which worked with, uh, with Ponte Corvo, and Yasef Sadi ended up playing himself in the film. So there are these scenes in the film which are the most visceral recreations of Fanon's own words um, in both uh, A Dying Colonialism, a book he published in 1959, The Sociology of a Revolution, and in The Wretched of the Earth. For example, 
There's a remarkable scene in the Battle of Algiers of a group of Algerian women, very famous women who later became heroes, heroines um, after the war, uh, dressing up as Europeans before they enter the European city, passing through checkpoints, flirting with soldiers at checkpoints so that they can lay bombs um, in, uh, in an airport, in the, the Milk Bar Cafe, um, it's, an, it's a riveting um, sequence um, in this film. Uh, you know, and there are numerous other scenes in that movie that are evocative of Fanon. For example, the depiction of um, uh, the Kasba and then the European city. The montage in that film is straight out of the introduction uh, to, uh, to, to the Wretched of the Earth. So I think in that sense, Fanon would have been flattered. I think that... Um, Another thing that I think that would have appealed to him is that Pontecorvo's film is a wonderfully modernist work, and Fanon was attracted to modernism in the arts, and we know that he was an admirer, for example, of, um, of Alain René. There's a scene in the book where I describe Fanon going to see Hiroshima Mon Amour with a, with a group of friends. Um, so I think that Fanon, though, would have also been struck by one of the ironies um, not an on-screen irony, but an off-screen irony of the making of the Battle of Algiers. The Battle of Algiers was filmed um, in the Algerian capital in 1965. And it was filmed while uh, the Colonel Houari Boumedien was plotting the overthrow of, um, of Ahmed Ben Bella, um, Algeria's leader. And uh, when uh, and there, so there were there, the the the, uh, the the plotters of the coup actually pretended that some of their tanks were part of the film production, and so they kind of manipulated the film production in order to conceal what they were doing. So this film is a celebration of what Fanon would have called the interior of the Algerian revolution. In other words, the rebels who were fighting inside Algeria rather than the external forces, the army of the frontiers, which, which ultimately, thanks in, part, thanks in large part to French repression, became the dominant actor in the Algerian revolution and really put its stamp on the government that was put in place after the war. So you have this film, which like, like Fanon's own work, is a celebration of the democratic, participatory, radical force of the interior, but it's being used to conceal the consolidation of the exterior and the imposition of an increasingly authoritarian regime. You know, there hasn't been, speaking of film, a serious um, biopic uh, of Fanon, whereas there has been one um, of Patrice Lumumba, and one of the... Raoul Peck, though, the director of the Lumumba film, it has been trying to make film by Fanon for a while, so... Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, but there's an extraordinary passage in your book in which you detail uh, Fanon's 1960 trip to the Congo to, to, to meet with Lumumba. I'm wondering if you could say a few things about sure, that. Sure, sure. Yeah, the, 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 the Fanon-Lumumba relationship has been mythologized um, by many authors, um, including, um, including Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, and it's, it's true that they were friends. They, they met in 1958 um, at a Pan-African conference convened by Kwame Nkrumah um, in Ghana, and, and they liked each other. Um, they came from extremely different backgrounds. I mean, Fanon was a Fanon was a, a very middle-class guy. Uh, he came from a, a fairly reasonably bourgeois family in Fort-de-France. His parents were, were educated. His father was a customs inspector. Um, Fanon, of course, um, went, to a very, went to the best high school um, in Fort-de-France, uh, the Lycée Schelcher. Um, he had a very good education in France. He was conversant with all the latest trends in intellectual thought. Um, uh, you know, he, uh, he moved in pretty flashy circles. He was very elegant. Um, he was as French as you could get, even as he repudiated his Frenchness 
uh, Lumumba was a man from uh, the country. Um, he had been a beer salesman. Um, another contrast between the two is that um, Lumumba um, advocated a politics of civil disobedience and, and peaceful reform um, uh, in the context of um, Belgian Congo, and Fanon was an advocate of revolutionary violence. They were, they were, they were very, very different, but they, they were drawn to each other, and Fanon felt that there was something deeply African about Lumumba, warmth and a kindness, that, um, a sincerity that, that, that really touched him. So they became friends. But then two years later, uh, Fanon went to, uh, to what is now Kinshasa for a meeting, uh, a gathering of, of leaders from the region that Lumumba had called for because Lumumba was facing what turned out to be the terminal crisis of his very short time uh, in power. There were various conspiracies being hatched against him uh, by Shambe um, in the province that had, that had seceded, uh, by um, uh, Joseph Kasavubu, his, um, the, the president of, of Congo, eventually joined by, uh, by, uh, by Mobutu, and of course by the Belgians and the Americans. The Americans wanted Lumumba out, and, and uh, we know from uh, the, uh, uh, the memoirs of, of the CIA officer Larry Devlin that um, Devlin, stationed in Congo at the time, was doing everything that, that he could to remove Lumumba from power. So Lumumba was facing the crisis that would lead to his removal from power and eventually uh, his assassination. Now, Fanon uh, didn't go to Congo to defend Lumumba, as I think we've often come to believe. Uh, in fact, he went there as a representative of Algeria's government in exile, the GPRA, the Gouvernement Provisoire de la République Algérienne. In t exile in Tunis. Exile in Tunis, yes. So he flew from, I believe he was in, flew from Tunis. I, can, um, I can't remember if he flew from Accra or Tunis, but he, um, he was representing uh, Algeria's provisional government um, uh, in exile. And uh, the Algerians were ambivalent about Lumumba. Um, they needed to uh, remain in uh, good graces uh, with uh, Habib Bourgaba, uh, the leader of independent Tunisia, because Tunisia was the FLN's home and they had bases there. They didn't want to get thrown out of Tunisia and Bourgaba didn't like Lumumba. The Americans, of course, hated Lumumba and this is at a time when the Americans were, begin were getting closer to the FLN. The Americans understood that France's time in Algeria was rapidly expiring. They understood that, they also understood that the longer the French stayed, the more likely it was that the FLN, and therefore the independent Algerian Republic, would end up in the Soviet orbit. So the FLN uh, wanted to stay in good graces with the Americans as well. And so uh, when, Lumumba, when, uh, when Fanon got to uh, Kinshasa and saw that Lumumba was surrounded by, the, the Lumumba event was surrounded by noisy demonstrations because Lumumba's base was not Kinshasa, it was Leopoldville. Uh, Fanon and his FLN comrades um, were startled and they uh, had a meeting uh, with Lumumba and, and where Fanon told Lumumba we think that you should step down and form an opposition party. And uh, Lumumba did not listen to him, and we know what happened to Lumumba. It's one of the great tragedies of, uh, of post-colonial Africa. And when Fanon was in Italy in early 1961 uh, to meet with Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, Claude Lanzmann as well, he told Sartre and Beauvoir that he blamed himself uh, for two deaths. Two deaths were on his conscience. One was the death of his mentor, his Algerian mentor, Aban Ramdan, who had been killed by uh, his comrades in the FLN. This was a death that haunted Fanon. And the other death was Patrice Lumumba. He blamed him for Lumumba. He felt that if only Lumumba had listened to him, uh, 
he might be alive. So it's, it's quite a you know, poignant story. Excellent, Adam. Um, you're quite insistent in your book to depict Fanon as a psychiatrist and not as a psychoanalyst. Mm. And I'm wondering if you could just A, talk through that distinction sure. and also say a little about the way in which Fanon grappled with the psychology sure. of the colonial. Sure. Um, well, Fanon wasn't a psychoanalyst because he, first of all, he never underwent psychoanalysis. He never spent any time on the couch. And uh, he told his secretary, Marie-Jean Manuelon, that after the war he planned to do that and to train properly as a psychoanalyst because he was very interested in psychoanalytic writings. Um, he was quite interested in the work of Adler, who wrote a lot about the inferiority complex and who was interested in the whole question of aggression. Um, but he was also very much drawn to Freud's work. So he was, um, he was a reader in psychoanalysis. He actually conducted some psychoanalytic sessions with patients that he had, but he was not properly um, a psychoanalyst, whereas he, whereas he was very much a psychiatrist who um, was radical in some of his methods, but, but quite conservative in, in, in certain others. Uh, for example, he was a great believer in electroshock therapy and, and used it frequently. Which, by the way, I was very surprised to learn is still being it's coming used back. today. Yeah, it, apparently it's coming back. Yeah, so. Um, but, you know, Fanon, um, uh, Fanon tried to, wanted to historicize um, and politicize uh, how psychiatry um, uh, was conducted among people who had suffered from uh, colonial uh, oppression and aggression. And I and, um, believed that, um, that some of the problems that were um, attributed to family structures, um, or to problems in the brain, for that matter, were actually the, were actually, uh, the traces of um, deposited by oppression. Uh, one, I think one good example of this that precedes his, his work in Algeria um, uh, is the work that he did with North African uh, workers um, in France. In, in 1952, uh, before he, uh, some time before he went to Algeria, uh, he published uh, a remarkable essay in the French uh, journal of the Catholic left, Esprit, called uh, The So-Called North African Syndrome. And it was based on visits that he had paid to Algerian laborers who were living in a, 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 a particularly uh, uh, grim part of, of Lyon. These were uh, the so-called uh, French Muslims of Algeria. That was their official designation, the FMAs. Um, their families were back in Algeria. Um, they were alone. Uh, they were marginalized. They were uh, victims of, you know, pretty, you know, often the victims of racism. Um, they were often sleeping, you know, seven or eight to a room. And they complained of physical pains but couldn't actually identify what was ailing them. They would say things like, I feel sick all over. And French uh, psychiatrists had developed a diagnosis called the North African syndrome. And, and the argument essentially was that they're either lazy or they're crazy. You know, either they don't want to work, so they're making this up, or they're malade imaginaire of the Moliere type. And uh, Fanon's argument was, no, these are people who've had it you know, who've been clobbered with this idea that they were French. But in fact, they weren't French. They weren't treated as French. They were second-class citizens uh, at best. And his argument was that they were exhibiting um, a kind of uh, neurosis that resulted from their colonial condition. So, so can we bring that up without being crude to the Gaza moment? <laughs> Um, and to get some purchase, how Fanon's views or Fanonianism itself would 
come to grips with or grapple with what happened on October 7th? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that Fanon's writings illuminate both uh, the, the uprising and the acts of terror perpetrated on October 7 and uh, the Israeli response and this war that has come to assume an increasingly uh, murderous, arguably genocidal character. Um, Fanon, uh, <clears throat> you know, Fanon was of course insistent that oppression engenders violence. It's, a, it's a, not an idea that's unique to him, but it's an idea, of course, that he emphasized. There are also darker elements of Fanon's analysis of violence. For example, he writes that the dream of the colonized person, uh, the, the colonized person is a persecuted person who dreams constantly of becoming the perpetrator. And I, and I do think that that line, which is, which is uh, you know, which is quite a, a dis disturbing line, has a certain application to what we saw um, on October 7. Here, you know, after 16 or 17 years of, of blockade, of, uh, of, 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 of oppression, of isolation from the world, uh, a group of people uh, resist, um, uh, overcome this, this fortress of power, um, and then uh, carry out, um, you know, acts of violence that are often quite atrocious. Um, uh, so I, you know, and Fanon uh, wrote about uh, about the violence, um, the violent nature, the inherently violent nature of of anti-colonial uh, revolt. He was very familiar, for example, with the case of the Philippeville uprising of 1955, one of the uh, pivotal moments in the Algerian War of Independence. At the time that this took place, the FLN, the war had started a year earlier, but the FLN at that time was in an impasse. The war was not going well. They weren't getting enough support. They were isolated. The French, French repression had been very effective. Some people in the Algerian community were launching other initiatives that contradicted those of the FLN, and two commanders in an eastern region of Algeria armed a group of peasants with axes and other weapons, uh, told them that they would be receiving air support from Nasser, obviously a fiction, and they descended on a town, uh, Philippeville, um, in, in eastern Algeria, and proceeded to carry out a massacre of about 100 people, including many Algerians who were regarded as collaborators, disemboweling people, raping, pillaging. It was um, an absolute horror. And the French responded by killing upwards of 12,000 Algerians. And I, and I do think the Philippeville massacre is, in, is very reminiscent, or rather October 7 is very reminiscent of Philippeville. You have a movement, in this case Hamas, which um, is uh, uh, increasingly isolated, aside from its you know, relationship with Iran, of course. You have the Abraham Accords, which are an attempt to circumvent the whole question of Palestine. Palestine is being pushed off the map. The Palestinian cause is at risk of being forgotten in spite of the terrible repression to which Palestinians are subject wherever they happen to be living, whether it's Gaza, the West Bank, inside Israel, East Jerusalem. And to break out of that isolation, to remind the world that Palestinians still exist, Hamas mounts this operation, Al-Aqsa Flood, um, which does not end with an attack on soldiers, but becomes a kind of riot, right, in which you have the slaughter of people at the rave and also um, in the kibbutzes. Now, the Israeli reaction, I think, is also revealing of certain um, uh, is it, I think that the sorry I think that the um, the Israeli reaction um, can also be understood in some Fanonian terms as well. Fanon, for example, writes that that the colonizer invariably uses the language of the bestiary. What do we hear from uh, Yoav Gallant? They are animals, and we will treat them accordingly. No dis real distinction between Israel's defense soldier, minister. Israel's defense minister. The language uh, 
of the Israeli state is a language that is completely dehumanizing, animalizing, that treats Palestinians essentially uh, as subhumans. And uh, Fanon was also very emphatic about the spectacular nature of colonial violence and um, or, the, or the exhibitionist nature. And uh, you know, we've also seen that in what the Israelis have done in the Gaza Strip. There are also other aspects very reminiscent of the Algerian war. For example, during the Algerian war, uh, people living in the countryside were uh, forcibly displaced. About two million um, Algerians were driven into resettlement camps. Um, and you know, we see a similar process in the Gaza Strip where, nearly 90, where more than 90% of the population is forcibly uh, displaced. So um, you know, the, the situations are not identical. There are plenty of differences that we could allude to, but there are also very strong resemblances. So, so Adam, to avoid our own form of dehumanization here, I think we should take some questions. Because <laughs> um, time is short. So for those of you short or tall who would like to ask a question, please, yes, we have a question in the back. Step right up. Uh, thank you so much for your work. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your interpretation of Fanon's use of the veiling, unveiling metaphor. Thank you. Sure. Um, good question, and the question alludes to um, uh, a chapter in Fanon's book, Year Five of the Algerian Revolution, which was published in English as a dying colonialism. The chapter is called Algeria Unveiled. And this is the chapter that I was alluding to um, earlier when I talked about the scene in the Battle of Algiers where we see these women taking off their Hayek's, dressing up as European women and going to the European city to carry out these, um, these attacks. And this chapter is often, I think, um, uh, it's often misunderstood. And um, uh, in this chapter, Fanon is writing about women who have historically worn this, this, the, 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 uh, this head covering um, and who uh, remove it uh, for the purposes of, 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 of entering um, uh, the national combat taking part in the battle against the French. Now, uh, one of the arguments in this essay is that when, they do, when these women do this, they begin to experience a different relationship to their bodies. Fanon's drawing upon the phenomenology of Merleau-Ponty that had been so important to him. He had actually been a student of Merleau-Ponty um, in Lyon. He argues they develop a new relationship to their body. They begin to feel uh, a new sense of power, of liberation. Um, and his argument is that um, uh, these women, precisely these women, may go on to uh, claim a new place in an independent Algeria. They're, they're, they're not only liberating themselves from French colonialism, they're liberating themselves from Algerian patriarchy. That's one line of argument, um, a very hopeful line, which unfortunately turned out not to be true in, in post-war Algeria, uh, which quickly reverted to a very repressive politics of patriarchy. But the other argument is that is that at a certain stage in Algeria's struggle, the women who had removed the veil begin to reassume it. Uh, the veil had been a symbol under colonialism of, um, in his view, the sedimentation of Algerian culture. Algerian culture, in his view, ha had, had ceased to really develop and progress um, because Algerian culture was in a defensive position against the occupier. But his argument is that at a certain point, whether, you, whether or not you wear the veil becomes a choice. And in 1958, the French had begun to stage these unveiling ceremonies where Algerian women, some of them prostitutes actually, were um, gathered by the French army in the streets of Algiers. And there, either they removed their veils or French women removed their veils for them. And these were staged as celebrations of quote unquote emancipation. What the French were trying to do was to argue that French women, that Algerian women would be better served um, by remaining French, by staying 
you know, by, by Algeria remaining under French control than if they lived in an independent Algeria. So they should be liberated instead by the French. And the, the French believe that eventually if the women supported the French, so would the men, that the route to the heart of the men was through women. Now, um, uh, after the war, um, many of Fanon's interpreters, particularly in parts of the Islamic world, uh, came to uh, conclude that because Fanon was writing about the way in which the veil, the reassumed veil, became a symbol of defiance against these unveiling ceremonies, that Fanon was an advocate of the hijab. But he wasn't. He wasn't a supporter of the veil, nor was he an opponent to the veil. In that essay, he's really emphasizing the shifting significations of a piece of cloth depending on political context. I mean, this is, a, this is as much, I think, a political and semiotic essay as it is an essay about the veil as such. So, you know, Fanon was not an Islamist. He was, a, he was an atheist. Um, uh, and uh, was in no way of an Islamist. And in fact, uh, the, the current of the FLN that Fanon belonged to was a very left-wing progressive one that, alas, was crushed after independence, but it represented something at the time. Let's see if we can get in a couple of more questions. Gyorgios, please. Yeah, wait for the mic. Thank you. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, you mentioned his relationship with uh, Messezer at the Lycée Schelcher and Negritude. Could you say a few words, if you might, about why he took some distances in uh, Les Dames de la Terre, why he was ambivalent about Negritude as not the solution? Yeah, uh, Fanon... Um, First, maybe say who Aimé Césaire I will, was. I will. Aimé Césaire was um, a great Martinican poet who... Um, wrote um, a remarkable epic poem called um, Notebook of Return to the Native Land uh, that was published in the late 1930s. Uh, Césaire actually wrote this poem, or he began the poem when he was in, on, a, on, a, on, a, when he was on a, um, a holiday in Croatia. Uh, he was in Croatia with a friend and the friend said, he asked a friend what this island was and the friend said it's Martinska and Césaire thought, wow, Martinska, that sounds like Martinique. And he started writing this poem, and he finished it when he returned to Martinique. Um, and it's, a, it's an incredible allegory about uh, the plantation societies of, um, of, of the West Indies, of the, uh, of the Antilles. And Fanon was, uh, was deeply influenced by this work and would continue uh, to cite this work and other works by, by Aimé Césaire, including his great discourse on colonialism. Uh, which Césaire wrote when he was a communist senator in the French parliament. So uh, Fanon was not a student of Césaire. That's a myth, actually. But um, he became aware of, of Césaire's work in the 40s. Césaire, um, in the 1930s in Paris, well, he, when he was a student, had forged the Negritude movement with the Senegalese poet and statesman, future statesman, Leopold Sédar Senghor, and also with a, a Guyanan uh, poet named uh, Léon Gontran Damas. And their, their understandings of negritude or of blackness were actually quite different. Uh, Songor had a very mystical understanding of negritude, which emphasized a kind of trans-historical, immutable African personality. Uh, Césaire, uh, after all, was, a, you know, was a, a man of the New World, a West Indian, um, who was not an African, and his vision of negritude emphasized creation and invention. And in that sense, Fanon was much more sympathetic to Césaire's vision than he was to Songor's, although when he was a young man in Lyon and he was experiencing uh, anti-black racism, he was tempted by the promise of Songor's negritude and described himself in uh, Black Skin, White Masks as having waited in the irrational, waited in the irrational promise of, of Songor's vision um, of, of blackness. Now, um, Fanon's reservations about negritude were not merely theoretical. They weren't simply about a certain understanding of blackness. They were about politics. And his reservations increased as he became involved in political activism. Uh, Leopold Sédar Senghor, 
was very close to the French um, and uh, remained quite close um, after the war and was a party to the French community of Africa that, um, uh, over which uh, de Gaulle had presided in the late 1950s. And for Fanon, this was a betrayal of anti-colonialism. Sedar Senghor also aligned himself with France against Algeria's revolution, an even greater betrayal for Fanon, who had come to think of himself as an Algerian. Uh, Césaire's record was more mixed. Um, he had eventually uh, broken with the Communist Party um, because he felt uh, that the Communist Party was not taking issues of, of racism and colonialism seriously enough. But Césaire also erred, as Fanon uh, saw it, because he had advocated the departmentalization of Martinique. In other words, he wanted Martinique to remain, along with, um, uh, with Guadeloupe and Réunion, a part of France. Césaire's view was that Martinique and these other islands had more to lose by becoming independent, by becoming a federation. But um, Fanon thought this too. Uh, was a betrayal and that the French West Indies would be better off forging some kind of independence together. So, um, and I think Fanon also um, felt that Césaire said far too little about Algeria. So, his critique of negritude in Wretched of the Earth has to always be read um, against uh, the shifting politics um, of negritude, but we, we actually see these reservations early on in black and White Masks as well. At one point, uh, Fanon writes that um, the Viet Minh did not rebel because they had a culture to reclaim. They rebelled because they no longer could breathe. This, this, this line is often cited by latter-day Fanonians, but, it's, but, it's, but the context is rarely mentioned. What Fanon is saying here is that the Negritude movement emphasizes the reclamation of culture, the reclamation of a sense of Africanness and blackness, rather than direct political struggle. How did the Vietnamese win their independence from France? By seeking a Vietnamese culture that was unsullied? No, by fighting against their rulers. I think, Adam, that was, that, that was great. Um, we may have time to squeeze in one more question. Yes, please. Thanks. Um, you touched briefly upon the context around the FLN's um, environment. You were mentioning that the U.S. was quite sympathetic to their aims and also kind of envisioning this decolonization from the French that was going to happen. And I was wondering, how do you compare that to the current political environment? And I, I mean, we touched a bit on Gaza and Israel, um, but it's a, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the environment Fanon was working in and whether that was more conducive to producing such decolonial works as opposed to the environment we live in now where, you know, the US is kind of on the contrary, supporting Israel at any cost. Um, and yeah, what this has to say about, you know, if Fanon lived nowadays, would he be able to write what he wrote? Thanks. In 60 seconds. <laughs> um, you know, it's, 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 such a, it's such a different, con a very different context because I, I, I'm not, when I, when I talked about, about uh, uh, the United States' support for, for Algerian uh, independence, you know, we have to remember that um, uh, the states in that period was campaigning for the support and loyalty of these new states, you know, these new pop these populations that had finally won their independence because the Cold War was on. And um, I think that explained, it wasn't out of any kind of um, uh, uh, essential support for um, a, a liberation movement that the, uh, that the Americans supported the Algerians. Although, uh, you know, in 1960, 61, there was a bit of that, you know, that still existed because of the OSS's work during World War II and, and, and America's sense of itself, because America did have a very strong sense of itself as an anti-colonial power, even an anti-colonial empire, unlike the old European empires. Um, uh, you know, the case of Israel-Palestine, um, it's, it's, it's a longer conversation, and I'm, I'm, I just, I'm sorry, but I don't think I have time to get into it right now. Excellent. Adam, 
this, th this, this was a profound, um, serious, uh, and deeply, deeply uh, critical in the best sense conversation. And I'm going to now take off my hat of objectivity and say, buy this book. <laughs> Buy this book. This is the best intellectual biography I've ever read. The Rebels Clinic, The Revolutionary Lives of Franz Fanon. What are you waiting for? <laughs> so thank you to the Vienna Humanities Festival. Desi, I'll be happy to close this out again in 25 if you need me. And thank you so much, Thank Adam. you, Lenny. Thank you. <laughs>